There's a bridge between Memphis, Tennessee and West Memphis, Arkansas named the Hernando de Soto Bridge. It's a continuous cantilevered cable-stayed through arch design, and it is impressive. It is also broken as of May 11th. A fracture through a major support beam in the bottom truss has rendered the entire structure unsafe. No road traffic is being allowed over it, and for a while, no barge traffic was being allowed under it. This is unfortunate and inconvenient. This bridge carries I-40 across the Mississippi River. Critical infrastructure failures? Now that is something worth talking about, don't you think? Ah, infrastructure. Literally the backbone of any economy. Transportation, power, water, communication, health, emergency services, and so on and so forth, etc. Truth be told, we can live without government investment in infrastructure, but we cannot live the lives we have without it. In 2021, the federal government plans to spend just $97.9 billion on transportation, $7 billion on energy, $73 billion on community and regional development, $41.4 $41.4 billion on justice, $530.9 billion on healthcare services. Commerce spending is $258 billion, the space and science budget is $18.7 billion, and the education budget is $221.5 billion. Altogether, if one counts all of those expenditures as infrastructure, that's $1.2484 trillion, less than 25% of the total federal obligations for 2021. But Medicare and Medicaid grants consume $308.3 billion of that amount, and $32.5 billion is set aside for disaster relief. So the actual expenditure on potential infrastructure repair and development is just $907.6 billion, and significant amounts of that money go to loans and guarantees for loans. $6.7 billion for student aid and the American Opportunities Tax Credit, $2.8 billion for mortgage credits, $7.2 $7.2 billion for corporate tax credits, and so on. Now, let us put this in perspective. America faces a $2.59 trillion deferred maintenance gap for infrastructure, and infrastructure spending in 2020 was significantly lower as a portion of GDP than it has been in the last several decades. The American Society for Civil Engineers Infrastructure Report Card for 2021 rated the United States overall at a C-. Towards the bottom end of mediocre and in need of attention. This is better than the $4.59 trillion gap we faced in 2017, but still not even close to what we need to address the infrastructure issues we face. In category after category, we do not have sufficient capacity to create a surplus and encourage economic growth. In truth, what infrastructure we do have is often badly in need of repair or replacement. And the results? Well, there were over 500 bridge failures between 1989 and 2000. Since 2000, there have been dozens more failures, including the I-35 West bridge collapse in Minnesota, which killed or injured more than 150 people in 2007. Many more bridges have been closed in order to affect emergency repairs to prevent collapse. There have been at least 15 major dam failures in the United States since 2000, compared to the three failures recorded between 1982 and 1999. The power grid is now operating under such demand that rolling blackouts have become a standing joke in California and are moving into other states. Power transmission lines are aging, yet states like California purchase a significant amount of their power from other states rather than to permit the construction of local power plants and refuse to fund burying their power grid in order to protect it from threats due to weather, traffic accidents, and other external events. This is despite the fact that as recently as just a couple years ago, weather-related pressure on aging power lines caused them to spark triggering massive wildfires in California that killed people. Now, it's true that burying the power grid still leaves it vulnerable to earthquakes and flooding, but in all honesty, the real issue is that burying the grid will be expensive. High-voltage power lines would still have to be up in the air because of the properties of electricity, but local generation would cut down on the amount of long-distance transmission lines needed, and that doesn't sit well with Karens who play NIMBY with power generation. 
It pollutes. It's an eyesore. It will affect my property values. Blah, blah, blah. And the power grid managers are listening to those Karens, especially when they are elected officials. Pipelines are the safest, most efficient way to transport petroleum and its products. Recently, the Colonial Pipeline was shut down due to a ransomware attack. This created a public panic because there was no pipeline capacity to take up the slack for the Colonial. So despite the three or four week supply of gasoline on hand at the local terminals, the East Coast experienced critical shortages in less than a week. The vulnerabilities of the Colonial Pipeline to ransomware show that infrastructure often requires support from other infrastructure to work properly, highlighting another issue which needs to be addressed. Support for all aspects of infrastructure, not just the most visible aspects of it. The president should have come out and said that this was a minor issue, that gasoline supplies were still plentiful, and that we have a plan to address the vulnerabilities. What he said instead helped to create panic buying by highlighting how critical the pipeline was and vowing to bring the full might of the government against those who hacked the pipeline's control programs. Keep in mind that pipelines are a form of infrastructure which he has acted against just a couple months ago. <coughs> Keystone. <coughs> Meanwhile, has anyone in the United States not seen an increase in their fuel prices? Because that, too, reflects infrastructure issues. Whether the climate change folks like it or not, at least 80% of all energy used in the United States comes from fossil fuels. A shortage in fossil fuels, or in generation capacity at power plants which use fossil fuels, dries up the cost of production and transportation of goods and services, which in turn slows down the economy. Even electric cars must have electricity to run, and that means that they rely on fossil fuels like coal. We could build more of the cheapest, cleanest, safest energy production, of course, but for some reason, climate change folks do not like nuclear power, do they? We have just spent the best part of a year working from home, attending school from home, and ordering what we need from home so that we could avoid COVID exposure. In order to do that, we needed communications infrastructure, but we don't have the capacity. Many households did not have access to high-speed internet necessitating an emergency program to provide that access in support of the lockdowns. Now, whether you think that the lockdowns were necessary or not, that's still true. Our economy is limited by internet access bottlenecks. There is a lot of potential efficiency out there, just beyond the reach of those who are caught behind those bottlenecks. We have built a global economy based on just-in-time inventories, and yet we do not have the communications infrastructure to make just-in-time inventories practical for all businesses. All that means that those big businesses which already have stable internet models have an advantage over small businesses, which explains, in part, why smaller businesses are more dependent on brick-and-mortar locations, and why the richest people in the United States got considerably richer in 2020 while small businesses were struggling to survive or closing forever. And all of the socialists out there who seem to think that is a good reason to tax those big businesses out of existence by seizing the wealth of the business owners can get bent. Because chronically, underfunding infrastructure is a big part of what keeps the wealth gap going. Small businesses do not have the leverage that big businesses possess to force through major infrastructure overhaul legislation, nor do they have the funds to pay for those infrastructure improvements themselves. What the current administration needs to do is to continue the infrastructure funding trends which closed $2 trillion over 40% of the infrastructure gaps between 2017 and 2021. What they are doing, though, is cutting infrastructure funding in favor of other spending priorities. The administration has rescinded permits which allow the United States to maintain its energy independence and to build capacity, whether it is filling the gaps in infrastructure we already lack or providing surplus capacity to foster growth. Meanwhile, back in Memphis, there is a major bridge which is closed to traffic for quite some time to come due to a failure which might have been prevented if only more funding was available. I am beginning to wonder if our overall grade must slip to a D or below before this government will begin to treat infrastructure as a real priority.